We believe they wouldn't want to get rid of the alliance altogether because it's been successful. Uh, that's why one of the reasons Carlos Ghosn and everything that's going on with him seems to be rattling the company because he's inextricably linked with that turnaround and how successful it's been. Uh, I think there's always been a bit of consternation around the shareholding structure. So maybe that was something they might be looking to and change. It's asymmetric as well, isn't it? Yeah. Let us just remind viewers that the French state and Nissan, via Nissan Finance, both own circa 15% of Renault. So the French state's involved in this one as well, which is always makes it more interesting. Uh, and as I say, on the other side of it, it's 43.4% Renault's stake in Nissan as well, isn't it? Yeah. So reports suggest, I mean, we don't know exactly what they're thinking and a lot of the details behind this, but reports suggest that there is still some concern over the shareholding and they would like that to be more equal, maybe. Right. Um, but as for unravelling the alliance altogether, I don't think so, because it really was credited with saving Nissan. Um, just, just, actually, sorry, just one more, uh, sorry, <laughs> two more senior Gon allies or executives at Nissan have uh, been removed, put aside, put on garden leave, whatever it was I hear in the last 24 hours as well. Is this a putsch by senior executives, Japanese executives, to regain control of a Japanese company? I think we'll find that out eventually. I think there are still a lot of details to come out on, uh, on what's going on there. Okay. I want to ask you about something we've been debating this morning about a currency swap agreement that was signed off by apparently Ghosn, the bank uh, and Nissan itself, which tells us about a sprawling alliance, the Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi alliance, and underneath and in the individual companies themselves, certain things are happening, for instance, a personal arrangement that is now related to a company, a, a currency swap agreement where gains and losses sort of then are funneled through the company but borne out by an individual. Doesn't that sound highly unusual and completely unrelated to the business of making cars? It does. And to be honest, I think it's just the latest example of really focusing on corporate governance in the industry as a whole because we're starting to see um, a lot of things you know the VW scandal and going back to the GM ignition issue um, there seems to be a lot more focus on what's actually going on behind the scenes of these companies and the fact that um, you know the actual making and selling of cars is um, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes there. Does it remind you of the banking sector to an extent where you had enterprises, companies, corporations that grew so large and so complex, it was very hard for people to have oversight, whether that was boards, uh, other people in the company who might have been monitoring CEOs or chief financial officers, very hard to have control or scrutiny over the business because of the size. It's a good point and I think that's why there's a big question over what will happen with the Alliance now because it was going overseeing the, the whole thing. So the, it's questionable how many other people knew what would be going on at all the different companies. So with him, you know, his future uncertain, that's why there's a question over what happens to all the different companies and, and the Alliance in general. One thing I'll always, um, I remember many long interviews with Mr. Ghosn as well, and in many ways he's an absolute visionary, and regardless of what he's being alleged to have done now, I mean, he, he championed electric way before many other CEOs. So I'll doff my cap to him on this one. I remember talking about the Renault Zoe and things years ago, and these other products as well. But that doesn't change the fact that electric hasn't proved yet a bonanza for profitability for this sector. The OEMs virtually don't make money out of making cars. They make money out of finance, they make money out of the spare parts, they make money out of servicing. They virtually make money, you know better than I do, out of selling the actual vehicles as well. Is there anything going on in the industry at the moment that you think that means that valuations and the very low valuations we have and the low profitability we have now is going to change? Because I think 2019 is an enormous year for this sector given the fact that they are now, now coming forth with their electric offerings to take on the likes of Tesla. It's very challenging and you know this core business model of just selling cars it's going to be difficult because we're expecting to see weaker markets in the, the real key markets North America, Europe, China so they really do start to need to start doing something else which is why you're seeing them moving into things like mobility as a service and what does that mean, sorry? Sorry, that is... Well, no, um, no, just wait. It's, it's the latest buzz, is it? Yeah. They call on, it Maz or something? On-demand like? services, so right. um, offering uh, ride-sharing through apps and that kind of oh, thing. Oh, anyone rather can do that, though, can't they? That, that, that's the point, isn't it? All these amazing technology companies that, in many ways, you speak to and you uh, find out these amazing... Anyone can do that. You don't need an OEM for that, do you? Well, I think the idea for them is they can be in charge of a lot more of the journey. They can provide the cars that actually make the rides. They can keep that connection with the consumer, maybe keep some brand loyalty, because they just have to change something if they can't sell cars to individuals anymore. Mm.
Hi, I'm Giovanna Bersecchi and thank you for watching. You can check out more of our videos by clicking on the boxes on the screen. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more from CNBC International. Thank you for watching.